Well, hi and welcome. My name is Steve Layson. I'm part of the ministry team here at Jeringong Anglican Church, and I'd like to welcome you to our online prayer book service today. Uh, thanks for joining us. A little bit later, we'll be sharing in the Lord's Supper together, so you might like to uh, get some bread and some wine ready to go uh, so that you can join in with that, with that part of the service. But we're actually going to start off our service by singing a wonderful hymn of praise to our God. So, let me read a... Uh passage of scripture and we're going to sing a beauty this hymn is a one of the big favorites <laughs> okay so this is from um, Romans chapter 5 and uh, verse 6 the numbers are so small all right you see at just the right time when we were still powerless Christ died for the ungodly very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God has done great things in his creation, in the way he cares for his creation, sustains us, provides us with all we need. But the greatest of all is that act of reconciliation at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So to God be the glory. Great things he has done. And um, look, this is one to sing together, all right? This is not Colin singing it for you. We're singing it together, all right? Da, 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 da. done so loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life an atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice who oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Da, 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 da. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Da, 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 da. Great things He has taught us, great things He has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done, and give him the things he has done.
Well, the service order we'll be following today, you'll be able to find on page 134 of the Green Australian Prayer Books. Uh, so page 134, the second order of communion. The Lord be with you. To begin our service, it's here from the word of God. When you call to me, says the Lord, I will answer you. I will be with you in trouble. I will rescue you and honour you. Let us pray. Will you join with me at the prayer of preparation at the top of page 135? Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us, and write your law in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Now, of course, we don't always do those things, do we? We don't always love God with our heart, soul, mind and strength, or our neighbour as ourselves. So in penitence and faith, let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness of sins to all who turn to him in faith, pardons us and sets us free from all our sins. He strengthens us to do his will and keeps us in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In response to that message of forgiveness, what joyful message that is. Uh, will you join with me in the hymn of praise at the bottom of page 137? Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Well, before we hear from God's word, let me pray the collect for today. God of power and life, glory of all who believe in you, Fill the world with your splendour and show the nations the light of your truth. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. This morning's reading is from Romans 5, chapter 5, Romans chapter 5 verses 1 to 21. And the heading is Peace and Joy. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace, in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that sufferings produce perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. 
While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The next heading is Death Through Adam, Life Through Christ. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all have sinned, for before the Lord was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account where there is, when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those over who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by his grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overthrow to the many, overflow to the many. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if, by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was con condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The New Testament reading is from Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This is the word of the Lord. Well, before we think further on those passages, will you join with me as we say together the Nicene Creed, 
reminds us of the things that bind us together as God's people. It's on page 139 of the, of the prayer books. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I wonder if you can think of a particular invention or event, but we'll, we'll go with inventions, uh, that has really changed world history. A moment when, you know, before this, can really be compared with afterwards. You know, go all the way back, maybe it's, you know, the invention of fire, not that it was invented, but how to actually make it, or the wheel, or the alphabet that allowed communication, or maybe, you know, moving forward a bit, maybe the printing press, or something more practical, maybe the way that sailors learned how to navigate by the stars, which allowed for, you know, travel over vast distances without getting lost. You could think of all sorts of things. More recently, you know, radio waves that allow for messages to be sent vast distances and then all the kind of building on that until now we have, you know, our mobile phones and all the things that we can do. The internet or Wi-Fi, AI. We're kind of at the, on one of those moments that, you know, we're kind of on the verge of one of those moments. It's, it's easy to look back and kind of identify particular things. Uh, I was reading an article recently about uh, an invention that transformed Australian life that most of us would never even think of, and that was the uh, electric shearers for shearing the wool. Apparently it was revolutionary. It hasn't really changed my life, although I am appreciative today. <laughs> but uh, there are often these moments these particular moments or events maybe maybe it's events maybe it's things like world war one you know that particular assassination seemed to change everything although there were lots of other reasons involved that was the kind of moment that kicked it all off it's easy for us to do that and humans like you know like doing this we like looking back uh, you can see on tv or on youtube or whatever and there's always you know top 10 lists of something and it could be top 10 inventions, it could be top 10 you know, people who made a difference, whatever it might be. I'm mentioning all of this because here in Romans chapter 5, all of those get blown out of the water. Paul focuses on the thing that changes everything for everyone. The one thing, event, person, Jesus, dying on the cross and rising again, what that actually means for us. Because what Paul has been highlighting here in Romans chapter 5 is that because of Jesus, humanity can be reconciled to God. Now, I'm not sure if you always think of it that way, but what Paul is highlighting here is that this is at the heart of the good news of Jesus, of the very heart of what he came to do. It's actually at the heart of God and his purposes for humanity. Now, Romans chapter 5 has an awful lot in it. Uh, 
I'm sure the Bible readers kind of were a bit taken aback when they looked at the passages that they had for this week. Uh, I was even more taken aback, going, how am I going to try and capture all of this in one sermon? Uh, and I thought we could go through teasing out Paul's argument uh, because Paul has a particular purpose with this letter. He's writing to a church in Rome where he knows some of the people there, but he didn't found that church. It's not you know, uh, one that owes him a debt or, or he spent any time in. Uh, and so he's introducing himself to the whole church because he wants to partner with them in telling people about Jesus. He's actually got plans to go all the way to Spain. The Romans got in the way, the Roman government got in the way of those plans. He never got there. But at this point in time, he wants to go to Spain to tell people on the other side of the Mediterranean about Jesus. And he knows that he needs, you know, like any good missionary, he needs his church partners to help him do that. He's linked churches. And so he's wanting the church in Rome to be his linked church, or one of them. And so he's writing this letter to introduce himself and say, this is what I believe about Jesus. This is what I think the good news of Jesus is. And so that's why Romans is such a wonderful book, because he's really laying out, uh, laying out all of his thought, all of his belief. And he, you know, he's, he's trying to persuade them, and he's explaining, he's going into great detail, and these arguments flow on, and, and he gets so excited about it, he interrupts himself to you know, expand on a different point. Uh, it's a bit like when you, you know, put your mouse or uh, put your cursor over uh, you know, something, and up comes a little extra little window that explains that and then it goes away again. Paul does that to himself. He just didn't have a mouse to help him out. And so that's what we see just in this part of Romans chapter 5. So much information and so many wonderful truths and so many implications for us as Christians. And in looking at this, I thought, I'm going to just focus on one of them, reconciliation. I'm not saying that the others aren't important, and they all tie in together, and I'll mention them along the way, but we're just going to think about this idea of reconciliation. Because as I said, reconciliation is the heart of the message because it's the heart of God. You see, we, I think, as Christians who come to church and hear the Bible taught, or as people who've been you know, just starting to explore we might not think that reconciliation is the big theme of the Bible, but it is. We've been hearing about all sorts of big things like sin and forgiveness and judgment and all these sorts of things, and they're very much part of it, but that's because reconciliation is the main game. You see, at the very beginning, God created humanity to be in relationship with him. We read in Genesis how the universe is created and the high point of the very good creation is humanity. Humans made in God's image to be in relationship with him. And then you have what is possibly number two in terms of defining moments in human history, the fall. And Paul's been explaining that along the way so far in Romans and he mentions it here again. Humanity chose to sin against God. Adam disobeyed God, and that set the stage for everything else. And so humanity was out of relationship with God, kicked out of the garden, but also separate from God, unable to, be, to have that free access to God that they had when they were sinless. Now, what happens next? Well, the whole Bible happens. But the real main event, the next big event, defining event, is the one that we've been talking about here. Jesus comes and fixes the problem. Everything else kind of just takes a step back or a lot of steps back. Everything else in the Old Testament up till then is just setting the stage for this next big event. So really, human history is made in God's image, relationship broken, relationship restored. Jesus' return. That's kind of a really, really, really kind of big picture way of thinking about human history. And so what that means is, from the very outset, once humanity's relationship with God had been broken, God's purpose in everything after then is to bring humanity back into relationship with him, to reconcile us with him, being reconciled to God. So all of those events in the Old Testament, the, the prophets and the kings and the battles and the miracles and all the things that happen, all those stories, all the, 
the family trees and everything like that. It's all leading up to Jesus dying on the cross and coming back to life so that we could be reconciled with God. So you see that through the way, if you ever studied the way everything kind of leads to Jesus, how these events happen and these people marry and these children happen and this kingdom, all, all, all of that leads to Jesus. But it, all the way through you have this theme of reconciliation. Even as he was kicking them out of the Garden of Eden, God gives them a clue that one day there's going to be someone who's going to solve the problem that the serpent caused by being a serpent crusher. Someone from their family tree, a human will come. And then all along the way, there's these little other promises and clues. It's all about reconciliation. So with the nation of Israel, you have this whole kind of uh, illustration of the broken relationship and the need to restore the relationship because you've got all the nations of the world and God just picks one nation out to be his people. And they're to be separate from the rest of the world in the same way that the rest of humanity, the whole of humanity is separate from God because of sin. And then the law that's given them, well, there's all of these barriers and all these reminders that God is holy and we are not. All those strange food laws and even stranger other laws, all those ceremonies and rituals and sacrifices, everything about being clean and unclean, everything was about just making this kind of visual aid. God is holy, we are not. And there's nothing we can do to get back in relationship with him. Actually, he needs to do something and someone needs to pay the price. Back in those days, it was, you know, livestock. All of these themes of reconciliation, you also see in the way God deals with his people. He's blessing them in a land, but they rebel against him and they get punished or they even get kicked out of the land. It's the whole idea of relationship being broken. And then you see that... Uh, wonderful visual aid it's not so wonderful for Hosea but that wonderful visual aid of Hosea the prophet and his wife Goma Goma was a very unfaithful wife a notoriously unfaithful wife who we hear is not living with Hosea anymore because she's been having so many affairs and is now working as a prostitute and she's living you know in very sordid circumstances somewhere and God says to Hosea I want you to go and find your wife and reconcile with her and bring her back home. And I'm sure that was a really hard thing for Hosea to do, but the point of it was God is saying, this is like me and humanity. And all through the Old Testament, marriage is used as an illustration of the relationship between God and his people. It's like a marriage covenant and his people keep being unfaithful. Sin is equated to adultery. And so you see these, these images of reconciliation all the way through the Old Testament where time and time again the broken relationship is highlighted but God's uh, efforts to bring them back into relationship, his plan, the stages in his plan are all highlighted. And then you get to the New Testament and when Jesus is teaching, this theme of reconciliation just keeps shining through in the way that he goes... He just insists on being with the people that you're supposed to be separate from. He reconciles Jew and Gentile, holy and sinner. He's hanging out with tax collectors and lepers and Gentile women who, you know, with sordid backgrounds. Um, the, the time when he's talking to, you know, a Syrophoenician woman or a Samaritan woman and all this sort of thing. And so often it's mirroring the, the situation that Goma was in. And that's who Jesus is actually speaking to. The parable of the prodigal son. The son who does not deserve the welcome, the reception, the reconciliation he receives. And then in the letters we have Romans 5, Colossians 1, Ephesians 2. So many places where this theme of reconciliation is highlighted. Now why am I emphasising this? Well, I think we get so used to a lot of these Bible words and gospel words, forgiveness, justification, you know, we can tune out. And we talk about sin and forgiveness, and we know that we're saved through faith, and we hear these terms, but we, get, we, we just tune them out sometimes. And what Paul is reminding us of here is how God's heart 
for bringing us back into relationship with him, his heart for reconciliation, is what has been the reason for Jesus coming. It's the, it's the event. It's the defining thing. It's the, his motive and his achievement. Jesus died on the cross to deal with our sin and came back to life so we might live forever in relationship with God. And so here in Romans chapter 5, as Steve said, we've been talking about the consequences of sin and, and the wrath of God and death and then how Abraham was saved through faith because there's nothing we can do. And then, of course, that was credited to him as righteousness. It's that declaration, you are right with God. It doesn't matter what the, the situation is factually in terms of who you are, what you've done, but as far as God the judge is concerned, you are innocent, you are forgiven. And that's where we're at. And Paul says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. Again, wonderful Bible phrases that we can tune out. But just think about it. For the whole of human history, apart from a very short time at the beginning, we were not at peace with God. We were not in a good relationship with God. We were actually cut off from him. And we're so used to that that we forget that that's not the way it was supposed to be. And likewise, we experience death. Death is part of the human condition. And that's what people say, you know, death is just part of life. And we forget it wasn't supposed to be that way. It's an expression of that broken relationship. And so it's really important for us as Christians to remember that being back in relationship with God is a big deal. The fact that we were not in relationship with God and we now are is a huge deal. It's what it's all about. That loving heart of God longing to bring us back into his embrace. And so that's why in the midst of all these amazing truths that Paul outlines and explains and the, the argument he's building in Romans chapter 5, reconciliation keeps popping up. You know, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God. And so that is actually what gives us this hope that that eternal relationship with God that we are going to enjoy, that's the thing that motivates us and inspires us for everything we do now. You know, we can't boast in our own achievements, but we don't need to because we're right with God. We can actually boast about him. You know, at just the right time, Jesus died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've now received reconciliation. It's, it's a wonderful truth that lies at the very centre of everything. And that has huge implications for us. Huge implications for us, the way we live our lives. You see, reconciliation, bringing people back into relationship with him, is at the very heart of who God is and how he operates and what he wants, then that should be the case for us. During our prayer time, we prayed for terrible situations going, in, going on in countries all over the world, and there are so many more other countries where equally terrible things are happening that aren't in our headlines. And that's just the outworking of sin and that broken relationship with God. See, the relationship gets broken when we say, no, God, not going to do it your way, not going to acknowledge you as Lord. I'm going to be the one that decides what's right and wrong. That's what Adam and Eve did. That's what we do all the time. But the way, once that relationship is broken and we, in all our wisdom, start deciding what's right and wrong, well, there are flow-on effects to everyone around us because the way we decide what's right and wrong doesn't always work for everyone else. And they get hurt by us. And of course, they're all doing exactly the same thing. And so we get hurt. And that happens on the individual scale as we experience relationships that include pain and suffering and hurt 
and all those sorts of things. Even in wonderful, loving families, you still have squabbles and arguments and things like that. And then, of course, there's so many families where you have decades without talking and all those sorts of things. But then it works out in a societal way as well, where we have crime and violence and persecution and oppression and exploitation and all those sorts of things and injustice. And then on a global scale, with all of the you know, wars between nations and the, the big things and climate change itself as a result of our sin in the way we treat the world and all that sort of thing. All of this has to do with that broken relationship with God, the consequence of sin. But since we are now back in relationship with God because of Jesus, because we've put our faith in him, we are now set free to live God's way. And to actually be the agents of change through the work of his spirit through us. And so reconciliation needs to be our goal. Reconciliation in the relationships we have around us. And what we insist on in our society. And lobby for locally, state level, federal, internationally. Our heart should be like God's heart. And so that's why reconciliation is such a big deal for us. And likewise, reconciliation with God should be a big deal for us. In that it's not just something we get to enjoy for ourselves, we should want to share that. That's why Paul says we don't boast about our own good deeds because ultimately they can't do anything for us and they're not what's brought us back into relationship with God. We need to boast about what God has done. We need to boast about this reconciliation. And it's a bit hard to boast if you don't say anything. We need to be boasting about God's loving, embrace of all people back into his heart by telling people about Jesus. So reconciliation really is what Paul is so excited about. And the way he's been building this argument, the problem of sin and God's solution through Jesus and then our access into that through faith leads to understanding we now have peace with God but the flow and effects, the implications of that peace with God are immense. Peace in our own hearts, free from guilt. Peace with other people as we seek to not act in the way we used to by prioritising ourselves but putting them first, having that same heart with God. Peace as we encourage good and good relationships in our society and in our world. So what all of this means is there are some challenges for us. When we read through Romans chapter 5 and other places as well, we read, for example, once we were alienated from God, and we're enemies in our minds because of our evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled us by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish, free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and don't move on from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and which I, Paul, have become a servant. So it means we have to live as people who are in relationship with God and seek to obey him. So godliness and holiness is important. And as I said before, telling people about Jesus is important. Lots of challenges in that. Lots for us to kind of get our heads around and get on with. I'll narrow them down for you. I'll, make, I'll, I'll bullet point them if that's the way your mind works. First one, be reconciled to God. I know most people here are I know most people here have put their faith in Jesus, but maybe you're someone who hasn't. Maybe it's something you're still exploring. Acknowledge the reality of your sinful heart. Turn back to God. Put your faith in Jesus and experience that wonderful joy of knowing forgiveness and peace. The wonderful thing is most of us have already done that, but that doesn't mean there's nothing to do. And as I said, we, we get complacent, we tune these things out, we think we know it all. We've got to be reconciled to each other. 
Now, on the whole, I think this is a pretty good church family. We're not, you know, massively divided by factions and all those sorts of things that you can unfortunately hear about in other churches because the devil loves to get in and do that because it stops people telling others about Jesus and witnessing to him. But there might be people in this church family that you do have a bit of a grudge with or you haven't forgiven for something that they've done. We need to be reconciled to each other. You see, sin, the snake in the garden, keeps wanting to wreck our relationships with God and with each other. And so we have to respond in the way God did. There was a wonderful theologian called Miroslav Volf. He's a Croatian Christian who was around during the uh, Bosnian War in the 1990s. He's Croatian. Uh, there was lots of stuff going on between the Croats and the Serbs and all this sort of thing. Um, and he realized that as a Christian, he had to learn how to forgive Serbian people. So reconciliation, the rubber really hit the road for him. And as he explored this in his head and his Bible reading and everything, he realized that human sinfulness expresses itself in exclusion and deception and injustice and violence. But because of the reconciling death of Jesus, the Christian response must be embrace, truth, justice and peace now he was talking about a particular war back then but it applies in our own personal lives and it applies to Ukraine and Russia Israel and Palestine North and South Korea whatever the divisions might be in societies there's the challenge for us be reconciled to each other and lobby for reconciliation in our world and thirdly, be holy. We've been brought back into relationship with God in order that we might be like God, in his image, live his way, proclaim this good news. So we've, you know, we've been set free from sin, so let's not tolerate it in our lives. And finally, and you won't hear ministers saying this very often, we need to boast. We need to boast about Jesus, this wonderful reconciliation. We need to be telling people how they too can be back in relationship with God, which is their ultimate problem. However, the impact of sin is having effects in their lives. We need to be telling them about Jesus. And we can do that with confidence and not anxiety. Because we have this wonderful hope. Because after all, we did nothing to save ourselves. God is the one who did the work in us and ultimately did the work through Jesus. And it's the same in the growth of his kingdom. We just have to be faithful. We tell people about Jesus and let God do his work in their hearts. So let's boast about the wonderful reconciling love of God expressed through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, words can't even begin to express how amazing your love and your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness are. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God of reconciliation. And so, Lord, we pray that everyone here would put their faith in Jesus and be saved. And we pray, Lord, that this wonderful model of reconciliation and the knowledge that we are holy in your sight would inspire us to be holy in our lives and to seek reconciliation with everyone around us. We pray for reconciliation in our personal lives, whether it's family or friends or colleagues. We pray for reconciliation in our society. We particularly think, Lord, of reconciliation between indigenous and non-indigenous in our land. And we pray for wisdom and peace in the way this debate is conducted and in the results. Heavenly Father, we pray that your spirit of peace would work in the world to bring about reconciliation in places where we think it would be impossible. For we know that in you nothing is impossible. And so we do pray, Lord, 
for peace in Ukraine, for peace in Yemen and Sudan, for peace in Myanmar, for peace in so many places, Lord. Too many to count, but you count and you count every tear and you hear every cry. We pray, Lord, for peace. We pray, Lord, that we can be bold in our proclamation, that we can be boasting not in our own good deeds, but in your good deed of sending Jesus to save us. You are the God of reconciliation, Lord, and we pray that we would have that same heart. We pray all this in the Reconciler's great name. Amen. Well, in response to what we've heard from God's word, will you join with me as we pray together? You can follow along on page 140 of the prayer books. Let us pray for all people and for the church throughout the world. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, has promised that you'll hear us when we ask in faith. Receive the prayers we offer. We pray for the church around the world. We pray for the unity of your people gathered around your word. Lord, may, we, may all your people submit to the, the truth of your word, proclaim it fearlessly and boldly, and Father, we pray that you would work through your church across the world uh, to bring more people into your kingdom. We pray particularly for our, our church's link missionaries. We pray for the cows in Italy. We pray for Andrew and Beck uh, in the Middle East. We also pray for the Damons in Cobar and uh, the Sh Shoalhaven Aboriginal Community Church. We ask, Father, that you might work through all of these and other ministries uh, for the good of your people and for the pro proclamation of your gospel. May all people come to know, to hear about you and come to put their trust in you. Strengthen your people for their witness and work in the world and empower your ministers faithfully to proclaim the gospel and to administer your holy sacraments. Unite in the truth all who confess your name that we may live together in love and proclaim your glory in all the world. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Heavenly Father, we also pray for the peoples of the world. We give you thanks for our leaders, for our Prime Minister and, and Premier. We give you thanks for Charles, our King. And we pray for each of them and all those who, who minister underneath them, to all those who work in government and in public service, that they might work for the good of our nation and for the, the, the good of the people in it. But we also pray for other leaders around the world as they address the big issues that are facing our world at the moment. We continue to pray for peace in the Ukraine. We also pray for peace in places like Eritrea and Myanmar and Yemen and Nigeria and South Sudan and, and in Syria. Lord God, we ask that you might bring peace where there seems to be no possibility of peace. We ask that you might bring to repentance those who uh, have acted selfishly or greedily, those who act with pride. And Lord, we pray that the leaders of the world might, might unite uh, in their attacks on the big issues like uh, climate change and uh, refugees across the world and world poverty. Father, we ask that you might help all leaders to, to find common ground rather than seeking their own good, seek, just but seeking the good of others. Give wisdom to those in authority in every land and guide all peoples in the way of righteousness and peace so that they may share with justice the resources of the earth, work together in trust and seek the common good. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We also pray for our own community. We give you thanks for the beautiful place that it is uh, to live in Jerengong and surrounds. We thank you for the peace and the freedom that we enjoy here. But we recognise that there are still many people in our community who don't know you. There are so many people living their lives without reference to you, Lord. And so we ask that you might move in their hearts. Use us in whatever way you see fit to bring glory to your name and the proclamation of your truth to, to our, our needing world. We commend to your keeping, Father, ourselves and each other, our families, our neighbours, and our friends. Enable us by your spirit to live in love for you and for one another. Father, hear our prayer 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. We also pray for those who are in need. There are so many in our world who are suffering from sickness, depression, anxiety, poverty, abuse, uh, and so many other sufferings. We pray for those who are grieving, for those who uh, have been left out, for those who are feeling sad or, or sick in any way. We pray also for those who care for them. You might like to bring before God, to God now those known to you who are suffering. Comfort and heal, merciful Lord, all who are in sorrow, need, sickness or any other trouble. Give them a firm trust in your goodness. Help those who minister to them and bring us all into the joy of your salvation. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we praise you, Lord God, for your faithful servants in every age. And we pray that we, with all who have died in the faith of Christ, may be brought to a joyful resurrection and the fulfilment of your eternal kingdom. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to come now to share in the Lord's Supper together. So if you haven't done so already, you might like to organise to get some bread and some wine or juice um, so that you can take part in this part of the service. We're picking up the service on page 143. In John 3.16 we read, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the Apostle Paul writes, As often as you eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man or a woman examine themselves and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So will you join with me in the prayer of humble access you'll find at the bottom of page 143. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that, we, that he may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. We are the body of Christ. His spirit is with us. The peace of the Lord be always with you. If you return with me in your prayer books to page 165, page 165, we'll continue with the, form, the fourth form of the thanksgiving. And as you do, lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. All glory and honour, thanks and praise, be yours now and always. Lord, Holy Father, mighty creator, ever-living God. We give thanks and praise for your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who, by his death on the cross and rising to new life, offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And now, Father, we pray that we who receive these, your gifts of bread and wine, according to our Saviour's word, may be partakers of his body and his blood. For on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when giving thanks to you, his almighty Father, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. And again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We offer our prayer and praise, Father, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Blessing and honour and glory and power are yours for ever and ever. Amen. We who are many are one body in Christ, for we all share in the one bread. Come, let us take this holy sacrament, the body and blood of Christ, in remembrance that he died for us, and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. So taking the bread. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died, that your sins can be forgiven and be thankful. And taking the cup, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. In John 1 we read, To all who received him, to all who believed in his name, Christ gave the power to become children of God. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us in this hope that we have grasped so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name. And on page 174 we pray together. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, we've always come to the end of our service, but before we do, let's sing together.
I say thank you for joining us for our online service today. I hope you've been encouraged and even challenged from the things that you've heard uh, as we've looked at God's word together, as we've prayed and sung and shared in the Lord's, Lord's Supper together. To finish off our service, now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.